Okay, so we're going to uh, try this with a different video recording software. Um, so I am just uploading a video of the PowerPoint slides for the next topic, which is system analysis in the frequency domain. Um, so what we're going to be looking at is the response of a linear time invariant system. Um, which we have done before when we talked about impulse responses, but now we're going to look at it in the frequency domain instead of the time domain. So why do we want to do that? Well, because as you might remember, um, the output of a system uh, for an input signal x of t is involves a convolution, a convolution with the impulse response. And as we've seen, we want to sort of avoid convolution from now on. We know that convolution in the time in one domain uh, means multiplication in the other domain, um, which is much easier. So if we can look at the system in the frequency domain, and we've already figured out how to talk about signals in the frequency domain, then if we want to uh, find the response to a system, then it's just simply a multiplication of the system, in, uh, sorry, the system response in the frequency domain h of omega and the signal x of omega and h of omega is called the transfer function so rather than going strictly in the time domain we're going to work our way around that by first converting the input to the frequency domain then going through the system which we also convert the impulse response into the frequency domain and we get our result y of omega and then just do an inverse Fourier transform to find the output in the time domain. Now you would have already seen this before in ENEL 343 in your uh, transfer discussion about transfer functions but what's really going on is at the heart of this we are assuming that the input to the system is a single complex exponential at a single frequency omega naught. So remember when we looked at things in the time domain, we broke down into a signal into a bunch of shifted and scaled impulses. Now, when we talk about frequency domain, what we're doing is breaking down into a, a signal into a bunch of shifted and scaled sinusoids. So that's why we're looking at it this way. So if our input is a single tone, a single frequency component, and we take a look at the convolution results, so the convolution L integral tells us that um, uh, the output uh, there on the right and what I've done is I have uh, factored out the e to the j omega naught t because that has nothing to do with tau which means we can pull it outside the integral. Now what's left is by definition the Fourier transform of h of t at the single frequency omega naught. And that has an amplitude and a phase. So if we take a look at the results at the bottom line there, effectively all we've done is the output is taking that single frequency sinusoid and it is doing amplitude scaling on it and it is doing a phase shift on it, and that is all. So the response of the system to that complex exponential input is still that same exponential, except that it might be scaled in amplitude and it might be shifted in phase. Okay, so now let's think about a cosine. Well, a cosine is just two complex exponentials. And if I go through the same process, I get amplitude and phase shifting on each of those individual complex exponentials. And because of conjugate symmetry, what we end up with is that the output is just a scaled, amplitude scaled version with a possible phase shift. And this happens for every single frequency. Now the thing is that each frequency component might have a different amplitude scaling and a different phase shifting. So if we think of a periodic signal, which we can describe with a Fourier series, 
then take a look at the output. I can reverse the order of the summation and the convolution. And this just tells us that each of those individual frequency components at frequencies k omega naught, each of those is has an amplitude shift and a phase shift and that can just get incorporated into the Fourier series coefficient. So CK goes to DK where DK is the multiplication of CK by H of K omega naught. So each Fourier component has an amplitude scaling and a phase shift. What if we have a non-periodic signal? Well, we've already looked, we've already told, we've already studied how signals have a Fourier transform. So if I look on the right hand side, the output should just be the convolution of that with an impulse response. And again, I can change the order of convolution and integration. So now I'm going to concentrate on that convolution. Well, by definition, that's just the integral definition of the convolution. And there's a couple steps here, but I have again pulled out that e to the j omega t from the tau integral because it's a constant. And then what's left in the curly brackets is just a uh, uh, the Fourier transform of, of h of t. So that becomes h of omega. And then that is by definition y of omega. So the output in the frequency domain is just the multiplication of x and h of omega, which just means that every frequency component of the output is just an amplitude scaled version of the frequency components of the input with a possible phase shift for each frequency as well. So the magnitude of that output spectrum is equal to the magnitudes of the multiplication of the input and the transfer and a possible phase shift. Okay, so why do we even want to look at this? Well, because now we don't have to even look at systems in the time domain and think of them as a convolution. We can just look at them in the frequency domain and think of it as a multiplication. Okay, so this is where um, you may have heard me in class always talk about how everything is a filter. So every system is basically a filter. Now when we think of filter, effectively what we're thinking of is um, scaling and shifting of frequency components. So amplitude scaling and phase shifting. So when we think filters, we almost immediately jump to the frequency domain. Um, in signal processing applications, we're designing those filters so as to change the amplitude or relative significance of various frequency components in the signal. So a graphic equalizer is a good example of that. When you play with those sliders, you're basically changing the amplitude of that frequency component to change its relative weighting compared to other frequency components. That process is referred to as filtering and the system that facilitates it is called a filter. But in reality, all systems are filters because all systems have a transfer function. They all do something to every frequency component. So for example, if we have a communications channel where we have a transmitter, we have the channel and then the receiver. So the channel is basically the medium um, over which the signal transmits. So it could be a wire, it could be a fiber optic cable, it could be through the air. Well, ideally, if we're communicating some information, the received signal would be identical to the transmitted signal. But in practice, that channel is a filter. It introduces distortion. So one way we can, uh, pardon my email popping up on the bottom, one way that we can remove that effect of the channel is to um, characterize it and then create a system called an equalizer which perfectly reverses the effects of the channel. And if we want that to be reversed, then we want HC times HE to equal one. 
in the frequency domain. And that way we should get the same received signal. So that's just one example. Every system or filter modifies an input and sometimes we get undesired effects and the effect is distortion of the input signal. So we like to think of this again in the frequency domain because we talk about amplitude distortion and phase distortion. Amplitude distortion occurs when different components are scaled by different amounts and that leads to a change in shape of the output signal. And phase distortion occurs when different frequency components are phase shifted by different amounts and that also leads to a change in shape of the output signal. For distortionless transmission, let's think about what we want. So if we had a simple system which just says the output is equal to the input, then y of omega equals x of omega, which means the transfer function for that system is just one for all frequencies. So that's a pretty simple system. It's really just a nothing system. Now, if its Fourier transform is equal to one for all frequencies, that means its impulse response is just an impulse. But that doesn't really help us. So what if we said that the requirement for distortionless transmission is that y of t has to have the same shape as x of t, but it could be scaled in amplitude and it could be shifted by some time amount. Well, if you look at your Fourier transform tables, that tells us what h of omega should be. And so for a distortionless filter, then what we want is a transfer function that has a constant amplitude spectrum and a linear phase spectrum. That means that every frequency um, is scaled by the same amount of time shift, which gives us a resultant linear phase shift. And that means that the impulse response would be k times delta of t minus td. So we have a system that has a delay and a gain, and that's it. Now, if we look at that graphically, so an ideal filter would have an amplitude of phase spectrum, which look like this. In practical terms, however, you may recall that an RC filter actually has some roll off. Um, it has sort of a bell shaped curve and the phase is not linear. It's actually a, sorry, I can't remember. I think it's an inverse tangent. Um, however, there is a portion where it's close to linear. So if we stay within a small frequency range, we actually get close to an ideal filter. Now we still like to think of idealized filters. So we're going to talk about three different types, low pass, band pass, and high pass. And again, we're talking about the frequency domain here. So an ideal all pass filter is our distortionless filter that we just talked about before. But the problem is that requires infinite bandwidth and that is absolutely impossible to build in practice. So if we relax our definition and just say, we want a filter that lets through all frequencies in a certain frequency range with a constant gain, but then there's a sharp cutoff and we don't really care what happens past some nominal frequency omega naught. We still want the phase to be linear. Then in the frequency domain, what's the transfer function that describes that? Well, it's a pulse with a linear phase shift. And that's what's described in the equation on the left. Now, what about a high pass filter? Let's say we wanted to actually let high frequencies through. Well, it's basically just the reverse of a low pass filter. So it's just one minus a low pass filter. So here we're letting all frequencies through above omega naught. Or another way of saying is we actually have, we are actually um, destroying all frequencies below omega naught. So we're basically filtering them out. And then finally, we can have what's called a bandpass filter, 
So a bandpass filter is where we let frequencies through a certain frequency range, say omega 1 to omega 2. Um, and again, it's basically just a pulse, but we have to have that conjugate um, in the negative frequency so that we have a real filter. Um, this would be an example of an audio system, for instance, where let's say we only want to let voice frequencies through. So omega 1 might be 300 hertz, omega 2 might be 3000 hertz, and then you have a voice filter. Um, if you want a music filter, you probably want that to go from 20 to 20 kilohertz. The opposite of that is what's called a band stop filter. So that means we let through all frequencies except in a certain frequency range. Okay, and that's the end of this discussion. And you're going to be doing a worksheet on that on Wednesday.